All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, everyone here in person and everyone uh, watching online uh, via the live stream. My name is Richard Fontaine. I'm CEO of the Center for New American Security. And uh, really pleased to welcome all of you and Kurt Campbell, who is the Deputy Assistant to the President and Coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs at the National Security Council, uh, here to talk uh, a bit about uh, the administration's Indo-Pacific strategy, their policies toward different countries in the Indo-Pacific, and the state of affairs. Kurt is uh, recently back from a trip to the region, uh, including in the Pacific, and um, so we'll talk about some of that. You know, in the first two years, the Biden administration has stressed the importance of the Indo-Pacific region in its national security strategy and the Indo-Pacific strategy that it released uh, a bit more than a year ago in the announcement of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework and through the recognition of China as the United States' uh, primary uh, pacing challenge. And so, uh, pleased to have Kurt here with us today at CNES to discuss these aspects of the Biden administration strategy and more and take stock of some of the successes and challenges uh, that are going on. Uh, before we get the conversation started, uh, viewers online can participate in the conversation by entering questions into the chat box, cnas.org slash live, or on Twitter using hashtag CNAS2023. And uh, Kurt and I, will uh, I'll ha have some questions for Kurt, and then we'll take questions from uh, the online audience and here in, in the room as well. So, um, Kurt, welcome. Welcome back to CNES. Um, maybe we can start uh, with big picture kind of questions. So, you know, the as I just described, the administration continues to put a lot of emphasis in its documents and its activities on Asia, the importance of Asia, um, engagement in Asia, but of course there's a raging war in Europe that consumes uh, a lot of bandwidth uh, of all kinds. Um, how do you see that balanced out and uh, has the, uh, the, the oxygen that has been consumed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine affected uh, the ability of the administration to focus on Asia? Uh, Richard, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be back at uh, the Center for New American Security. I spent a lot of time here in the past. I, I'm thrilled to see Richard succeeding as a fantastic CEO and leading the center really in remarkable ways. I will just say I just uh, I just finished a report uh, that I had a chance to look at that just caught my eye this morning on how the challenges between India and China, uh, the border issues, affect and impact the Indo-Pacific. And I was just struck reading it. It was designed exactly for the kind of life I live. It was relatively short. It was very clear, specific recommendations and actionable. So I just compliments to the author's terrific piece, really helps us understand how this region is linked together and what the significance of challenges uh, that may not be directly in the maritime uh, arena of the Indo-Pacific affect the overall calculus. And so, Richard, I think you know, and you've been involved for a couple of years now in a project to examine how the United States has um, attempted uh, several times now to refocus, redirect um, attention and resources more towards the Indo-Pacific. I think one of the interesting things, this is a, probably the most dynamic uh, arena in the world, job growth, innovation, security challenges, environmental issues. Uh, this is um, going to be the most uh, dynamic uh, geographical region of the world in the 21st century without question. And it is also for the first time in our history that the Indo-Pacific is undeniably the leading arena in terms of strategic thought and focus. There have been periods in the past that it's been important during the Vietnam War, during the Second World War, but it was often thought of as a secondary theater. This is the first time that I think most strategic analysts and theorists and statesmen would suggest that this is the dominant arena. Um, we've uh, tried to sort of uh, underscore and accept and redirect uh, uh, focus in the past, sometimes uh, haltingly, uh, sometimes with not enough focus or resources. I think this time we've managed to um, engage not only uh, the U.S. government but allies and partners and frankly a bipartisan consensus in the United States about the need to step up our game in the Indo-Pacific more uh, generally. 
And I will say one of the interesting things about the um, challenging conflict, the war in Ukraine, is uh, the sense of how the conflict has linked uh, the European theater in the, in the Indo-Pacific uh, theater in ways that I don't think we fully appreciated until now. We've got, as you point out, uh, Richard, a raging war with desperate stakes. The United States working with uh, European um, allies and partners to take steps to buttress and support our uh, Ukrainian friends. But at the same time, what's different from other issues that have uh, been uh, swept or have uh, taken place in Europe is the fact that Indo-Pacific partners have joined in to the support of Ukraine in ways that are unprecedented, probably led by Japan, both support for sanctions but material support, South Korea, Australia, Singapore, New Zealand, we can go down the list in ways that are unprecedented. And I think what all these countries recognize is that the Ukrainian challenge represents not just you know, a, a, a regional challenge to the local order, but a global challenge to the, to the operating system that, frankly, both Europe and the Indo-Pacific Asia have benefited from. And I think there is concern that the um, alliance or association between China and Russia um, links the region in ways that are of uh, concern. And so uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific are engaged for a variety of reasons. They've been animated and inspired by uh, the role of the Ukrainians fighting against these incredible odds. I think they recognize that in many ways that, that these, l these regions are linked strategically, as I suggest. But I think they also recognize that any sense that, that Putin would be successful in his campaign to unsettle and destabilize the international order, seize um, uh, uh, territory, could have manifestations elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific that would not be in the strategic interests of any country across the Indo-Pacific. And so I think in many respects, rather than taking away from our efforts in the Indo-Pacific, Indo it has in, encouraged us and caused uh, there to be more focus. And so I would say that the last two years have been among the most consequential periods of in, uh, U.S. engagement in totality, not just the executive branch, but again, something that you have fo focused closely on, Richard, a, a enhanced renaissance of the legislative branch's engagement in the Indo-Pacific as well. So I, I'm actually more optimistic and believe that in many respects there is almost a unifying field theory about why you know, progress in one area requires increasing demands in another. Um, let's talk about China and uh, the administration's sort of overall big picture approach to China. So one thing that you can hear sometimes with our friends in the region is they still are trying to figure out exactly what the United States wants in its relationship with China. They know what the United States doesn't want, and that list is pretty long. Um, but what is the sort of long-term equilibrium uh, relationship between the United States and China uh, that we are aiming for? Is it we live with a China run by the Chinese Communist Party, but it does not do some of the things we don't like, or is it some sort of different scenario? What is the economic relationship? Is it uh, bifurcation of our economies or just stuff that's very sensitive? How, what, what is the objective yeah. of our China policy? So l let me first say just at the, at the outset, Richard, so um, strategy towards Asia, have, there have been a number of groups that have focused on how to think about the formulation and execution of American strategy in the Indo-Pacific for decades, the dominant uh, theory or the dominant approach often was, you know, uh, uh, do your diplomacy with Beijing directly, and then the other parts of the region sort of will follow suit. Sort of a a um, U.S. Uh, to China big power uh, uh, diplomacy more generally. Um, and then there was probably a secondary school which believed that the more important framework was to deal effectively with allies and partners, create a larger context for then engaging China more directly. And I think the second school was a smaller school, 
until quite recently, and I believe that there is now a dominant consensus that the best way to engage uh, Beijing is to first start working with allies and partners, not just uh, across the Indo-Pacific, but again in Europe uh, uh, and elsewhere. And I think that's what President Biden has sought to do and his team. It is to work not only with our existing bilateral engagements, but also with new partners, weaving in intricate, innovative uh, new institutions like the Quad with existing frameworks like U.S. commitment to ASEAN more generally. I think what we've tried to underscore is that, you know, we, we in many respects, uh, uh, accept the, the uh, China as it exists. Um, I think oftentimes in the past we've spent an enormous amount of time thinking about how our policies would affect the trajectory of Chinese power. And I think we've often tended to overestimate our ability to dictate um, how China will evolve and the kinds of choices that it will likely make. I think we recognize now that the most important steps that we can take have to do with the operating system and about how we work with allies and partners and the things that we think are important to preserve and uh, stabilize. So I think what we've tried to indicate is that we do believe we're in the early stages of a new phase of uh, our relationship between uh, Washington and Beijing and that there are elements of that strategy that are evolving. But we believe that the dominant framing of it, Richard, is competition. And we seek it to be peaceful competition. We, th we seek it to be competition in areas where we believe that the United States has every ability, both acting alone and working with partners to be successful. But we also acknowledge that there are going to be areas where we uh, want to find common ground, common purpose between the United States and China and also with other countries where there needs to be some degree of, um, of common purpose. And we would say that, you know, ideally that would be on climate change. Um, we always thought that we'd be able to work together if we were confronted with a global disease. That was, uh, uh, I think those hopes were dashed during COVID, but there would be, I think, um, potential efforts on dealing with uh, cancer, potentially thinking a little bit about um, uh, fentanyl challenges in the United States. There are areas that we could potentially um, collaborate going forward. Um, I think there's also a recognition that in many respects um, our efforts to build a foundation, a floor under the relationship and guardrails have yet to be successful. I think the Chinese have been reluctant to engage in um, discussions around confidence building or crisis communications or hotlines. Um, uh, I think we believe that given the fact that our forces operate in proximity, we're going to have increasing challenges. I think we seek those kinds of communication mechanisms. I think that's a responsible step. We built those during the Cold War. We think that they are appropriate now. And we believe that the strategic rationale is, um, uh, is uh, clear uh, for taking those steps more directly. I think at Bali, I think President Biden and President Xi made clear that they were going to take careful steps to, to build a uh, more predictable, stable relationship with all its challenges in, in the months uh, and years ahead. Now that was, I think some of those steps were um, interrupted by the unanticipated giant spy balloon that went across the United States. And I think you will see in the coming months whether it's going to be possible um, to reestablish um, effective, uh, predictable, constructive diplomacy between the United States and China. I do want to just reassure listeners and the audience that it is very much the American intention to keep those lines of communication open. We believe that is the responsible thing to do. And we don't do that as a favor. We do that because it is in our strategic interests. And frankly, our allies and partners want a constructive relationship between the United States and China that does not take the world into a uh, confrontation that, that no one seeks. So the administration came in 
two years ago saying, as you just said, that the spirit of competition should not be reason to avoid cooperation in areas of mutual interest. Talked as you have about climate change <clears throat> and global pandemics and narcotics and nonproliferation, all these other areas where at least theoretically our interests overlap and we could cooperate. And the Chinese have said the same. They said, we want to cooperate. Is there any cooperation going on bilaterally now? And if there's not, we're still talking about what could happen two years later. Does that not suggest pretty strongly that that's not going to happen anytime soon? So, so Richard, I would, I would, I would simply say that I, I think um, uh, when the Biden team arrived and there was a sort of a careful diagnostic, I think our sense was that we wanted to improve our st standing domestically with some investments and technologies and capabilities and our partnerships, that we wanted to strengthen our position before we um, embarked on an ambitious or uh, determined diplomacy with Beijing. And that's exactly what we've done. We've spent that first 18 to 24 months investing in those partnerships, the Quad, AUKUS, all the things that you uh, mentioned, engagement in the Pacific, new venues for diplomacy in Europe about the Indo-Pacific um, in an effort to make quite clear to those that may question uh, American staying power or whether the United States is um, in decline. We are here to stay and we are uh, going to be and continue to play an important role uh, in global politics for decades to come. And I think, Richard, you're a student of the Indo-Pacific. This is not new. There have been previous periods. There's questions about American grit, American staying power. We are seeking to make clear to everyone uh, our intention to continue to play a leading role, not, not as a, 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 a dominant, uh, you know, overriding country, but as a strong partner with allies and friends who share common goals and interests in the region as a whole. I'm going to ask two more questions and then go to folks both online that put uh, questions in the chat and then here in the room, so be thinking about what you might want to ask. Um, let me ask one more question about uh, China and, and the uh, U.S. activities. So I think the administration, I think it's safe to say the administration's sort of creativity in developing new arrangements and institutions and, and presence in the Indo-Pacific is is greater than any other region in the world by far. And you can look at the, you know, the further re-energized quad. You can look at AUKUS, the new basing uh, access in the Philippines. You can look at the uh, kind of arrangements that we're making uh, with Japan. And I mean, you can sort of tell a story of all of this, South Pacific. Um, and yet, the can, we, can we just leave it at that? No, no, but there's the, right, no. Okay, that would be right, too. That would be too easy. Right. Uh, but 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 so of course the Chinese say, well, they're surrounding us. They're trying yeah. to contain us and they're trying to surround us on our you know in our home region. And this is a threat, a threat to which we will feel like we need to respond or at least worry about. So why why are they wrong yeah. about that? So, so Richard, I, I I think what we have seen over the last five or ten years is a series of actions that. Um, that have challenged the global order and that have raised questions about China's goals and ambitions, not just in one or two places, but in a variety of places. I began by talking about the India-China border. Some of the steps that China have taken uh, along this vast, you know, 5,000 mile border have been provocative and deeply concerning to Indian partners and friends. There's been a series of actions in Europe. Europe uh, actually quite um, uh, determined during uh, much of the 90s and 2000s and into the, tw into the knots to continue to have a strong relationship with China only to find uh, enormous challenges on a variety of things and countries uh, criticized publicly. The, the, the ground zero for wolf warrior diplomacy in many respects was in Europe. Um, you know, Australia, a close and dear uh, ally and partner, was the subject of really an undeclared economic boycott. Other countries um, uh, uh, went through periods of sanctions, undeclared and the like. You know, maritime challenges in the South China Sea, greater provocations across the Taiwan Strait. So you add that up and it is a series of activities that I can assure you that in quiet conversation, every country is concerned by. 
And so I think what countries believe that they are doing is largely responding to a security environment which is changing rapidly. So it is undeniable since you know the, the last or the Taiwan Straits crisis of 1994-1995, China has essentially spent more money and built a larger military than any country in history. This is substantial investments and many countries in the Indo-Pacific are, are concerned by that. They don't talk about it necessarily publicly all the time, but in private conversations, even countries that are on China's borders in Southeast Asia are worried about that, concerned by it. And so they seek a balancing engagement. They see a country that seeks to buttress, again, um, what I would call the operating system. And I do want to just point out to colleagues and friends that if you look at the last 70 or 80 years, or just 40 or 50 years, for the Indo-Pacific, it is one of the most impressive periods in our history. Huge number of pe numbers of people pulled out of poverty, wealth creation, innovation, peace and stability, dialogue, constructive engagement. There are many reasons for this, many reasons for this, but I would simply say that one of the important reasons has also been the role that the United States has played as a stabilizing force in the Indo-Pacific. And so I would also say, look, what, what China's accomplished is remarkable during that period. And a huge part of that is the innovation and hard work of the Chinese people. But we also helped create an environment in which China was able to focus on those tasks. We believe that there are some signs that China is seeking to alter that compact, those complex, you know, understandings about freedom of navigation, peaceful resolution of disputes, the sort of, again, the, the, the framework that has led to this remarkable peace and prosperity, to alter it in ways that perhaps favor China, but perhaps do not uh, serve the same interests uh, uh, for other countries in the region. And so I think the idea here is not to in any way challenge China or surround China, but to protect um, our interests and to make sure that, that through common effort we are able to stabilize and strengthen the elements of this system which we think have benefited all. And so, um, uh, you know, I do hear the rhetoric and I do see the propaganda on a regular basis. I can assure you when we are engaging partners in the region on most occasions we're talking to them about issues that matter to them where they live. Climate change, investment, illegal fishing, education, technology. Those are the things that the United States seeks to partner um, with countries in the region about. I, one of uh, a friend uh, of both of ours who's an astute observer in the region who and, and is from uh, the region put it on this issue of responding this way, which I thought was pretty illuminating. You know, if you look at India, you look at Japan, you look at the ASEAN countries, these are countries that would prefer to be relatively pacifist and relatively non-aligned. But they're not. They're becoming less non-aligned and less pacifist. Why could that be? They're responding to yeah. what they believe to be threats to their security. I, and I just underscore that, Richard, and just remember, like, like the steps that Prime Minister Kishida in Japan has taken just in the last several months are unprecedented in its history. And this is a country that has a deep commitment to pacifism and, and frankly has been reluctant to engage in overt military uh, steps. Prime Minister Kishida was able to convince a relatively wary public that these steps, increasing defense spending, investing in new capabilities were essential for Japan to make its way in a more dangerous world. I would also point out just 10 years ago, if you ask me which countries were most enthralled with the idea of a much deeper engagement with um, China, it would probably be Great Britain and Australia, yeah. two countries that have chosen in the last month to associate with the United States in a, in a technological military um, uh, partnership that in many respects is unprecedented that is not for a couple of months, but is profound, enduring, probably will um, 
shift and shape the politics of all three countries in profound ways. And that was done after much thought and consideration and a recognition that perhaps, again, the strategic environment had fundamentally changed and the strategic thinking in Australia and Great Britain, deeply sober, very sober-minded, a recognition that these kinds of steps have to be taken very carefully after substantial consultation and deep um, internal reflection. All right, let's go to questions here. If there are any in the room, we can go here, and there's a few online. Yeah, back here. Uh, wait, hang on just one second. There's a mic coming right over to you. Um, two questions. And please identify yourself. Sure, I'm yeah. sorry. Bill DeAndrews, and I, I guess formerly I was with the January 6th committee, but that no longer exists. So. Um, how concerned are you about China's use of malign foreign influence and disinformation, both in the U.S. and globally? I mean, clearly the Russians do a lot, but, but how much yeah. are the Chinese doing? So, um, Bill, first of all, thank you for all that you do, and it's good to see you. Um, I, look, uh, um, I think what we see, I'll give you an example. I just got back from the Pacific and traveled through the region. In almost every stop, I occasionally was confronted by elements of disinformation that, that uh, are the result of aligning uh, efforts by both uh, Russia and China, um, uh, making allegations about American biological and chemical efforts in Ukraine, things that are just outlandish and, and, and deeply troubling and problematic. Um, I, I think we, we've seen that in the global south in ways that I think the United States is concerned and our allies and partner are concerned by. But it doesn't end there. We also see other activities in certain countries that I think we have to um, be attentive to and monitor. Um, when the Australians started to do a diagnostic on certain Chinese activities inside their country, they were surprised about the level of, of uh, Chinese engagement with student groups, with organizations, with elites, with universities that were, that were antithetical to Australian interests. And we've seen those activities elsewhere. You will, have, you will note that just in the last couple of weeks, there have been substantial debates about that in Canada, right? And I think there's been efforts on Capitol Hill to ensure that we understand the nature of some of those efforts in the United States as well. And so I, I think this is an area that is in significant need of greater focus. And there is a recognition that, that, the, that, the, that the global narrative, uh, particularly in the South, the United States faces real challenges. and. There are activities online with organizations, um, uh, with other groups in a number of countries, including the United States, that I think um, are, again, antithetical to our interests. One of the bright spots in the region is the increasing warmth between Seoul and Tokyo. Um, some pretty historic steps that have been taken yeah. in uh, even recent weeks and months. Uh, what do you think is the is that, is that you expect that direction to continue, and what do you think is the kind of things that the United States would like to see come out of that relationship in yeah. terms of cooperation or trilateral, bilateral? Thank you, and I think as you've seen, a succession of administrations have sought to fo focus on this very important trilateral relationship. We saw it in the Bush administration, in the Obama administration, the Trump administration, now we've tried to double down on it. We've had a series of trilateral engagements at virtually every level in our government from the president on down. Our most recent trilateral engagement was in Cambodia during, um, uh, during the ASEAN meetings just a couple of months ago. We anticipate other engagements uh, in the near future. I think there are many purposes behind this, uh, Richard. One is basically just strong deterrence and solidarity in the face of, of increasing North Korean provocations. I think that's the central um, uh, purpose, but also increasingly to diversify beyond that, to talk about technology standards, to talk about 
um, regional issues and, and challenges and to see what's possible with respect to trilateral engagement. We have our two strongest bilateral partners are between the United States and Japan and the United States and Seoul. Look, we recognize there are limits to what is possible, but we seek for some of these activities to be increasingly t trilateral. We recognize that there are some political challenges in both capitals, but to those who say that really it's none of our business and we should stand back and let them work everything out, we, we have um, uh, been encouraging from the sidelines, but we've spoken very clearly, Richard, that it is in our interests, our strategic interests for Japan and the ROK to get along better, to recognize the importance of their relationship and how much they can do uh, together working with the United States and others going forward. I do want to commend the courage of President Yoon and his decision to take some of these steps and to go to uh, 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 Japan and to make some unilateral mm -hmm. um, uh, steps in a way that is, um, you don't see that kind of courage often on the global stage and it has to be acknowledged and obviously Prime Minister Kishida um, received him uh, uh, well. We're hoping, however, that we will see even more from both capitals going forward. And again, as I said, watch this space. We will be engaged accordingly. There's a question from Nyanima from ABP Live in India. What role do you want India to play in line with the U.S. Indo-Pacific policy vision? And where is the quad headed? So two yeah, broad questions. Very good questions. So look, I, I do want to just underscore that our engagement broadly is with the region and institutions but undeniably in this very diverse, large regions, there are areas of intense focus. If you asked me what is the most important bilateral relationship for the United States into the 21st century, for me it is the U.S. relationship with India. And I believe we are destined to work more closely together. I believe that our people to people, our strong ties, animate in a, a relationship that is becoming deeper, uh, richer, uh, uh, and more strategically important. Um, we uh, have, uh, there, there has been an exponential increase in engagement on virtually every area, Richard, on technology. You will have just seen, we yeah. just concluded discussions in a, in a forum called ISET in which the Indian National Security Advisor brought the highest ranking group of Indian technologists ever to come to any country and came to the United States to talk about how to partner on areas going forward. We're working more on defense related issues, on people to people. We want more Indian uh, students in our universities. We want more American students in Indian universities. We want more people to people, university partnerships more generally. Uh, health partnerships, uh, we've just announced uh, efforts to work together in space. And so the agenda is extraordinarily rich. The ambitions are high. I do want to underscore something that's, that's important. I India is a great power. India is not an ally of the United States and will never be an ally of the United States. But it does not mean that we'll, we will not be close partners and share many things. And that's how we need to understand the role that India will play as a great nation on the global stage. And we want to encourage that and support that and deepen this relationship, which is already very strong, probably the strongest people-to-people -people relationship of any country um, that the United States has um, uh, on the global stage. So we're proud of the fact, again, um, it was the Bush administration, uh, George uh, W. Bush, after the tragedy of the tsunami, brought the Quad together to deal with the tragedy that took place in uh, Southeast Asia and Indonesia and in its environs. Um, th four maritime democracies getting together to talk about common purpose and how to respond together. Um, since then, the, the institution had, has waxed and waned. I think the Trump administration sought to bring it back. Uh, there are a number of meetings that took place at lower levels. President Biden's vision was to take it to the leader level. 
just two years ago. Um, at that time, it was actually quite difficult to get agreement to do it. Now it's just thought of as a normal part of the, uh, of the architecture of the 21st century, an exciting part, but still something that we almost take for granted. Our agenda uh, is to do several things when the leaders meet in uh, Sydney in uh, the coming months. First is to review the progress on our existing work, which has been substantial. And I do want to underscore that this is an alignment that is, it's an unofficial group, that is basically about dealing with the needs of um, regional friends and partners, mostly in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. I think we're going to focus on issues associated with um, infrastructure. We're going to focus on maritime domain awareness. We're going to look carefully about how we advance educational initiatives. The Quad um, Fellows will be taking their places in American universities as we speak. We're very proud of that, how to take those steps, strengthen them, how to work together our Coast Guards, how to think about uh, practical areas of common purpose that address the needs of nations and peoples uh, across the region as a whole. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to say, Richard, after some you know, weariness and skepticism, lines of communication are being developed between the COD and out Southeast Asia. And I think we've been very much, our initiatives, initiatives have been very much welcomed across the Pacific. Great, there's a question, I think, right here. Oh, yeah, right there, and then we'll go to Lisa after. Hi. Hi. Thanks. Um, Mike Okuna-Heimans, I'm based at uh, The Hague, Klingendal Institute. Um, you were saying, of course, uh, telling about uh, the security uh, field where the United States is responding to local needs. Um, helping um, Indo-Pacific countries. Um, I was wondering, what about the economic field? There's a lot yeah. of uh, local needs there as well. Yeah. Uh, economic development is another way to help those countries. And what they want most, of course, is uh, for the United States to go beyond IPEF and to work with in CPTPP, uh, for example, or other trade liberalization. Now, we know that this is a hugely complicated issue here yeah. in Washington, but do you intend in the coming two years at least to take to spend some political capital to, yeah. to get that moving? So l let me just... Uh, try to address, thank you for the question, some of the immediate issues. So first of all, I think what you're going to see over the course of the next little while, Richard was asking the question about are there real signs that the, that the pivot or the rebalance or the, the, the focus of American diplomacy is shifted towards the Indo-Pacific. You will see in our budgets, in our engagements, more assistance, more focus in the region, both climate, bilateral, yeah health, the, the Mekong across the board, much more focus in terms of aid and assistance, number one. And remember, as countries come out of um, COVID, sometimes in, in this period, that kind of assistance turns out to be critical because it's trade and tourism have slumped. I think second, um, there are new institutions in the U.S. government, the DFC really um, is about creating leveraged finance in the region towards issues related to infrastructure and capacity building. Now that's still something that is still, you know, at relatively fledgling levels, but they are working in increasing partnership with other um, uh, vehicles in Asia like JBIC in Japan and other uh, finance and, uh, uh, you know, uh, development uh, vehicles uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And then third, you mentioned IPEF. Look, I, I, I do think it's important for us to be evaluated on what we've laid out. And we're right in the middle of a very complex set of negotiations around IPEF that involves digital trade, um, uh, environmental standards, labor issues, um, supply chains, uh, uh, data localization, everything that we believe is important in new age cutting uh, edge efforts associated with economic engagement between the United States and partners in the Indo-Pacific. And we, we are aiming to work constructively towards 
um, uh, efforts uh, at the end of this year as we go uh, into APEC more generally. I will say that, um, that many of our original trade initiatives, like TPP, when they were originally rolled out many years ago, were poo-pooed as not being very significant and lacking in ambition. And sometimes you have to give those initiatives time to, uh, to be fulsome, to come to fruition. And I think our goal with IPEF is to do the same. We're involved in a um, extraordinarily complex, multifaceted negotiation involving traditional partners like Japan and South Korea, emerging important partners in Southeast Asia like Indonesia and Vietnam, but also partners who in the past have never been engaged in such ventures like India and Fiji. And so I, I think before dismissing this as inadequate, um, let's give it a chance to see what we're able to unveil later this year and whether we can come up with a, a series of, uh, of um, arrangements that uh, are ambitious, that do meet the needs of uh, modern commerce. Uh, and recognize that uh, it is important for the United States to demonstrate a leadership role in economic commercial engagement. They want to see an open, optimistic America in an environment where trade is increasingly contested, undeniably so politically. But I don't think we're shrinking from the challenge. We're trying to lean into it, recognize that we need to deliver what we've started. Uh, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Oh, Lisa, it was your paper, wasn't it? I should have, I'm sorry, I should have said it. I, it's a really good paper. Thank you. All right. No, I didn't notice it. I, I read it and I like, I already, I, I and acted on it. So, and I, 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 even more than that, I've claimed that the ideas that you put out there to be my own. So, oh, the, that, the that highest form of phrase in Washington. <laughs> Uh, that's a, a gr uh, great flattering remark. So thank you for making that. Um, and I did co-author it with Derek Grossman of yeah. Rand Corporation. Thank you. Um, Please tell Derek. I sh I, I'm sorry I forgot the authors, but I, I knew that it was you. So thank you. And available for free to all on CNAS.org. <laughs> so but, but by all if, means, if, partake. If I could just give just the CNAS a, 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 just a plug here. So one of the hardest things is you see something that you want to read and you think, God, I, I, this looks really interesting. And then you start and think, well, God, I'm, I'm busy now. Maybe I'll get to it tonight. And you just put it aside. And, and it's not hard hitting and it's not arresting and there are not actionable steps. What CNAS has done, others have done it as well, but have done deeply policy relevant efforts in ways that, that matter to policymakers. A huge part of the Indo-Pacific equation is what's happening uh, at, you know, 20,000 feet, uh, this, this, this forsaken, uh, you know, uh, uh, very challenging border areas and how that plays out matters a lot about what happens in the Indo-Pacific. So I thank you for focusing on it. Well, Sorry, great. Lisa, go ahead. Thank you so much for mentioning it. Um, my question actually is related to something else. <laughs> uh, you talked about the U.S., South Korea, Japan trilateral. I'd like to ask about another potential trilateral, and that is U.S., Japan, Philippines. Uh, you talked about the new policies of the Japanese government, the new Japanese national security strategy, national defense strategy, breaking new ground, uh, but also the U.S.-Philippines relationship has, has been breaking new ground. Yes. Um, with the um, now establishment of four new military sites that the U.S. will gain access to, the negotiating of new defense guidelines to drive our mutual defense treaty. Um, there seems like there is, is greater opportunities for trilateral cooperation between our three countries. So I wondered if you could address that. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very good observation, and, um, and I think you are right to say and to see What's happened between Japan and the Philippines is remarkable, stepped up in a variety of areas. I think we have resurrected very many important elements of the bilateral relationship. I see 
Henry Howard here, grateful for the work that has been done to try to build a stronger relationship between the United States and the Philippines that we've always had in the past. The U.S. Philippine Institution has done remarkable things, the foundation to rebuild those ties that are so important to both of our countries. And we are ambitious about the um, possibilities of the relationship. And this, Richard, is another area where China has overstepped and taken uh, actions that, that are uh, concerning to Philippine friends. And I think our goal is to deepen the economic and commercial ties, the people to people, um, and also to see what's possible not only bilaterally but uh, multi and minilateral. So I, I, I don't think I can say anything beyond watch this space. But I think you will see in the very near future um, high-level engagement that is of both the bilateral quality and involves other partners as well. And we think that's important. And the Philippines have been encouraging of more dialogue with the United States at higher levels. And we're grateful for that. And we want to take advantage of those opportunities. So on Watch This Space, there's a question from David with Reuters. Uh, we'll see if you can uh, answer this. When can we expect a call between President Biden and Pre President Xi? And does a visit to Beijing by the Secretary of State have to come first? And is China amenable to both? So I, look, I, I'm not going to get uh, into thought, the that's what I thought. back yeah. and forth. But I will say <laughs> we've made very clear that we're ready to have that call. Hmm. And uh, we're prepared. And w from our perspective, we want to keep lines of communication open. And it is um, uh, our intention to keep uh, uh, those lines open. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Hiro Suzuki from JVIC. Thank you for mentioning about the collaboration between DFC and JVIC. It is uh, uh, very encouraging. My question is about recently, Japan's government released a new version of the free and open the Pacific. Yeah. And one of the key components is expanding the area of the focus from the maritime domain, domain to the other domains. And I'd like to ask your expectation for the collaboration in the space domain. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I think, as you probably know, um, we just concluded some space uh, discussions in uh, Tokyo. And uh, there are a number of uh, people from the U.S. government that were involved in these discussions for a uh, first time. They were shocked at the diversity of our engagement in space from everything from issues associated with weather to, um, to uh, positioning to uh, uh, tracking matters related to navigation. So it, it is remarkable how much the United States and Japan have, have, have worked together over years. I think we expect that that um, uh, cooperation will uh, increase under Artemis and that other countries have also expressed an interest in the Indo-Pacific. Um, space is a domain uh, where the potential for more engagement between the United States and Japan is important. I think you know the effort Japan has taken in terms of um, powerful boosters, a number of other uh, developments where I think the synergies between the United States and Japan are real. So, so I would say, I, I, I think what I have found interesting, and this is just a larger, um, a larger um, observation, not just about Japan and the region, I, I find generally with almost every country, Richard, that the door is open for collaboration on, on a range of projects. And there is a welcoming environment from the Philippines to Indonesia, to India, to Japan, to Cambodia, Laos. These countries want to do more with the United States. They're welcoming, they're encouraging. And, and so in, in many respects, the demand signal is greater now for American engagement and leadership than at any time I can remember or have studied, 50, 60 years. And that's something that we need to um, both uh, lean into and recognize in the formulation and execution of our own position. 
It's time for a couple more questions before we uh, break. There's one from Michael who asks, uh, how does Taiwan fit into the administration's overall Indo-Pacific strategy? So I, I would just simply say that the most important element of our approach is to preserve peace and stability. Yeah, right. And we believe that the preservation of the status quo uh, is in the best interests of all parties. We have taken a number of steps, Richard, through active diplomacy directly with the parties involved, with our four deployments. We adhere closely uh, to the Taiwan Relations Act, an act of, of remarkable legislative uh, leadership. We think that's uh, important. We have brought other countries into um, uh, the equation, making clear that the maintenance of peace and stability uh, is not just something that's important to the United States and, and, and Taiwan, but uh, is also of critical importance to countries in the Indo-Pacific. You will have seen that in many of our strategic documents and statements when leaders visit, there is unprecedented recognition of this fact. Um, we recognize that, that we face challenges, but at the same time, we are determined to take the necessary steps to preserve, again, a peace and stability that has been central to uh, all the accomplishments of the Indo-Pacific. And at the same time, we recognize that what Taiwan has accomplished um, with respect to a flourishing democracy, a thriving economy, remarkable technological innovation, is really something that we should um, uh, cherish and to, uh, and, and to support. The president has talked about putting human rights at the center of U.S. foreign policy. The Summit for Democracy is this week. What element of human rights and democracy promotion outside of China um, features in the approach to the Indo-Pacific? Yeah. So, look, Richard, everyone has a, you know, kind of a different theory of the case about how to, how to think about the uh, democracy promotion or how to think about democracy and and human values. I, I would simply say, I think a little bit how the president and other people think about it in the United States is there is a deep recognition that the challenges that countries are facing um, in terms of securing and stabilizing and strengthening uh, democracy are not um, somehow um, happening elsewhere, that, that we have our own challenges domestically. And so I think in many respects, these gatherings are thought of as um, uh, mutual encouragement, um, uh, techniques to help uh, um, advance uh, the institutions that support uh, democracy to uh, secure the rule of law, to take the necessary steps to um, uh, strengthen institutions that, are, that come under siege from both internal and external factors. And so I think in many respects, the United States approaches this gathering and others like it with a deep humility, a recognition that we can learn from many places and that, have, that have dealt with domestic challenges and that the challenges to democracy um, affect us as well. Okay, last question. Um, APEC, the United States is the host this year. The leaders meeting yeah. will be in November, so a ways off. But, uh, you know, a fairly unique opportunity to shape the agenda for what that unique grouping of countries will come together to discuss and try to achieve. Uh, have you figured out what will be on the agenda yet? Look, we've got a, uh, an ambitious agenda, Richard. I think, look, uh, APEC is that rare occasion when the United States or a country gets to host the other dynamic economies uh, from the Indo-Pacific, a broad group from both Latin America, the Asia mainland, other interested parties. Um, in the past, there have been a number of initiatives that have been put forward, both activities that improve the life and quality of business travel, issues associated with just basic things associated with, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the bureaucracy associated with certain kinds of engagements. I think our goal is to recognize that APEC does have some central things to play, a uh, role to play as we emerge out of COVID, as we think about climate change, as we think about empowering um, uh, 
smaller business groups in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so I think what you will see is the President will roll out a number of things that will try to address um, uh, our deep determination to play not just a security role and not just a diplomatic and political role, but a vibrant economic and commercial role as well. And so as you look over the course of the next several months, it is among the most dynamic uh, periods in modern diplomacy in the Indo-Pacific that will involve the Philippines. We don't announce everything at the stage, and it takes time to work things out. But all the key players in the, in the Indo-Pacific will be involved in very high-level engagements with the United States in a number of four in which we intend to lay out and amplify uh, elements of our strategy that uh, are going to be of critical importance. And I do want to say a huge part of that is also keeping our doors open mm -hmm. and to be prepared to sit down really at any time and engage directly and honestly with our Chinese interlocutors about each issues of mutual concern to both of us. Great. Well, Kurt, thank you for being here. Thanks for the tour of the horizon. Thank you, Richard. Please join me in thanking Kurt Campbell. And thank you all for being here or tuning in.